Yeah, values are, you know, if, if you say, like, what are your top values? People say like, honesty, you know, and, and um, integrity. You know, like, they're just words, right? right? But we kind of all know what they are. And um, I had this really interesting experience where this, another former student of mine, Adam Teed, who's a PhD, um, had come across this values work. Milton Rokic did this work historically, and then Shalom Schwartz. So Schwartz is an interesting scholar. He's um, he's American, but he spent a lot of his career in Israel. Very international scholar. He does a lot of surveys. And Schwartz's whole career, you know, and he's very senior at this point, was devoted to identifying values. Like, are there common values that all humans share around right. the world? It's an inspiring idea. Yeah, and trying to solve problems, right? Um, obviously, it's the human nature of the brain, right? We don't like not knowing. Um, we love to know the answer to everything. Um, and we come up with wild stories. Yeah. If there, yeah. if, you know, it's where Bigfoot comes in and right, just right, like right, um, right. stories of alien abductions. I mean, the most implausible narratives can be created to explain something right. that's often quite simple, but um, we can't see it. Yeah, and I think, you know, um, two points. I think one, in my own life, right, I, um, I learned by doing, and I've tried meditation for a long time, right? For my whole life, I dealt with, um, you know, anxiety, depression. I now know why and where it stemmed from. Um, I, you know, I, I don't say now that I don't have anxious thoughts or stress, but like I don't have anxiety anymore. Um, um, at least to the, not even close to, to the degree that I, that I did probably six months ago. Well, I know six months ago. And I think that the things that have helped me the most, you know, I've always been very, um, I work out twice a day, right? I always have I've eaten healthy, sleeps hard when you have ADHD and, you know, uh, are a, uh, uh, you know, high, high, hopeful, high performing person, right? You know, that's just hard to kind of shut off the brain. So still working on the sleep aspect of things, but I think- Yeah, some people channel yeah. ADHD to do, I mean, a lot of CEOs probably have that profile because right. they're just good at, um, you know, engaging fast and moving off and doing something else. Right, so, yeah. yeah. And, um, but I've tried meditation my whole life because I know the I know the benefits of mindfulness, right? And that there's a couple times I, I know, like I tried transcendental meditation, I've tried mindfulness meditation, um, you know, different breath work things, and I've implemented breath work that's worked for me. And for some people, mindfulness and meditation works wonders, right? For me, it didn't work. I just, I could never get myself to make it a habit. It wasn't enjoyable for me. Um, but I find, I've now find found mindfulness through psychedelics and through cold therapy, right? Those are two fast track ways to get to the point where I want to be, right? Which is in this kind of, you know, like you said, Zen mindful um, state. And then because of that, I've become so much more empathetic, so much more relaxed, right? I can, I can reason better. I think, you know, I can, um, I'm less, um, uh, I can kind of take a step back from situations that used to would have made me stressed or um, you know, that I would have had a, uh, a specific emotion towards, you know, anger, sadness, whatever, I can t kind of take a step back and view why, well, why are you going to express that emotion? And is that the best ex emotion to, to react from right now? And so like, I mean, dude, that is a superpower. Like, like yeah. it is an absolute superpower and like it has completely transformed my life. Um, yeah, congratulations. Yeah. I mean, well, just overcoming anxiety is huge. Absolutely huge. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and then one of the points you made earlier, which I wanted to touch on was, I think we all long for meaning, we all do long for meaningful conversations, relationships. And like, I know last time when you were here, uh, the first time we met, like we left a big networking event, it's filled with small talk and you know, people, you know, well, you know, where'd you go to school and what do you do, right? And like, like I can't do it, man. Like, like it, I, I, I love networking. It's like my God's, God's given gift to me is like me, trying to connect good people to good people mm. and seeing them do amazing things, right? That's that's what I, that's what gives me energy. Um, but I hate small talk, I hate it. So but then when we're over here, right, and we're enjoying a glass of, of, of bourbon, right, and we're, we're having deep conversations about the meaning of life and like I get to ask you questions and so on and so forth, like that also gives me energy, right? And you mentioned, you know, with your 
kind of in high school and what I think how the education system has failed us right now is that like we're teaching kids about things that they don't care about, like, like, like geology and like cursive, like who gives you shit, you know, like, and does it help you unless you're, unless that's something you want to do forever? Like, no, yeah. It, yeah. it doesn't. Right. And then you go to school and you start. So in, again, you mentioned that you're obviously a brilliant person, but you didn't, you were not tapped into your full potential because you're probably learning about things that didn't necessarily excite you as soon as you find something that excites you then you get into your lifelong passion of teaching and learning, right, about the, about the brain. Um, and you have these in-depth conversations about the meaning of life and all these certain things, right? So I thought that that was a super interesting point that you made, right? And I'm sure has a lot to do with, with the research and things that um, you have as well as from what it sounds like. Yeah, this is a good time to, to bring up neural plasticity or, or n- neuroplasticity, some people call it. And it's just the idea that our nervous system changes. It changes chemically and it changes, um, you know, day by day. And, uh, it's really the basis for so much of what we think of as, is the psychology of, of, of the mind, you know, learning is the key event. Like how do you, how, why does what some, something happens in this conversation, we're both going to remember it later. How does it get put up there? Like what's it, why does the important stuff stay or, um, you know, and the answer is that it's it's just like weight training. So just speaking, not as a as a cognitive neuroscientist, but as as a job, as just a yeah, just as a person. Yeah. I got into weight training um, around that same time. I went to college. I, I got really dogmatic about psychology and biology, and I was at the gym every day. Ab- absolutely, you know, and it it just um, it was really helpful to me. And I think if you've ever done any any sort of committed exercise, there's no escaping the fact that you get better at it 100%. and you feel better because of it. And um, I think neuroplasticity is just just like building muscles in a gym. You know, you do curls for biceps and you can actually see your biceps physically change shape. Right. That same thing goes on in your head. Mm. It's just, you can't see the neural networks change right. shape. They do change shape as we know from MRI based um, investigations of the last 20 years, there's this plasticity where, um, you know, when we recollect on this conversation, there'll be a memory network within each of our minds and it may even look similar and then it'll morph over time as our memories change. And so that's, I think the, really the, the basis for so much in life that's good for us and also bad for us. Mm. And the hopeful message is when something's going dysfunctionally, you're not happy with your relationships or your job or your life situation, um, that's the brain you have today. It's not the brain you're going to have the rest of your life. You can actually change your biology. And this is probably the strangest and most uh, almost science fiction aspect of the brain is the brain can modify itself. Mm-hmm. It's like if you've ever seen the Escher drawing of the hand, the hand, two hands are drawing yeah, one yeah. another. Right, it's right, like right. that. Yeah, like our, yeah. our brains can actually self-modify. And we have somewhere in there is, is us, the you and the me, that seems to be in control, but we're not fully in control, right? Sometimes our our minds and our, our bodies just kind of present things to us intuitively. Other times we can rein it in and kind of do something purposeful with what we call grit or discipline. Mm. And so um, that's what's so fascinating. I think in recent times, like juggling, you know, learning to juggle, there, there's a study on the, the white matter of the brain, the connectivity of the brain actually changing as one learns to juggle within the motor control regions for the arms, exactly where you'd expect it to happen. Right. And there's something incredibly therapeutic about, about exercise and new learning and taking action. And so, um, you know, I, I just started doing, uh, I, I've done weight training for 30 years and I just st- got into kettlebells, oh, yeah. which is very much weight training adjacent. It's like a different movement and it made all the sense in the world to me because it mm-hmm. was like, it really felt natural. And then if you've ever done halos with a kettlebell, oh, it's yeah. like you sort of move it around your head and I was so klutzy. Like yeah, I was hitting one myself best, with yeah, the thing. Yeah, one of the best four workouts you can do. But then like after just a couple of weeks, I could do these wonderful halos and it was like satisfying. I could see it happen. And it's like my nervous system adapted to the new action. And that's exactly what our brains are doing when we start to see ourselves differently or when we make a big change in our life, you're actually changing your neural system, which right. I think is fantastic. And to, to the meditation point you made earlier, um, 
there's a lot of studies on the connectivity of the brain in meditation states. It turns out it's very plastic. So a an expert meditator who's just done the discipline for a lot of years will have different um, brain act activity than a novice, which I, I think is, yeah. it, it, that is very much related to consciousness. And again, yeah, I think, um, again, uh, I think it's probably best that I don't write questions in an order before because like this whole thing, like I, we're completely changing what I originally intended to talk about, which is great um, because I think this is a perfect time to talk about kind of the, the, the brain optimization lab. Um, you know, the new program of Mission 38, which we're talking about, um, you know, I saw I, in my own life right, when I had depression and anxiety, which now, so um, not to get too into it, but my, you can, vi listeners who have been a, people who know my story and they can go back and listen to kind of why I was so depressed, but I was going through benzodiazepine withdrawal, which is now classified as a severe traumatic brain injury, right? So um, where it was like almost overnight, because I tried to just stop a cold turkey without understanding the, 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 Concept, the massive consequences that go with all of that. Um, um, and yeah, pharmacology is something that really has to be monitored from the outside. With some, you have to work with somebody because it's just, it's not something you can experiment with on your own and expect you know, really good outcomes. Yeah, I can be the first example of that. But I can also be, again, hopeful, right? Like, like so the brain optimization lab, there's eight modules. I've done every single one of those modules. Um, to increase my brain health, right? Like you said, like, I feel like this is the first time in history where we can, you know, we've known things that are good for health, but this is the first time in history where we actually know things that can increase brain health, right? That you can, you can escape darkness, right? You can start to begin to heal the brain. And if you can't heal the brain, then you can create new neuro pathways, right? So, um, you know, I saw a statistic that said that neuroplasticity increases cognition by 60%. Right. And so like as I'm learning all these things and, you know, trying psychedelics and, you know, um, trying breath work and trying mindfulness, like just like trying to get a, a whole grasp on the situation, you know, I think for the viewers and, and why this podcast is different than other ones is because like, you know, we can have you talking about it as a very intelligent um, person who's spent his whole life learning about it. And then me as someone who can like I, I've like it sounds weird to say, but like I can literally feel my brain very plastic not only during this conversation, but throughout the last three months, right? Like I've, um, and psychedelics have been proven to increase neuroplasticity by, or the, at least the early literature is showing that it increases neuroplasticity a lot, yeah, um, yeah. along with co contrast therapy and exercise, right? And, and you know, um, like you said, simulating conversations and, and meaning and purpose. And like, I feel myself wanting to learn and once I want to learn, I feel myself learning things and picking them up a lot quicker, right? Um, like I got back into boxing again, and now I, I thoroughly enjoy training again and getting into jump rope, kind of your mm. your your example of kettleballs, right? Like, yeah, like yeah. for me, it's like I can feel like what feels good, right? And like it's I can feel my brain having to think about the exercise instead of just like going into the gym, which strength training has tr a tremendous amount of value, um, and I still do that, but like, like I don't get as much, I'm not as excited as I am for a training uh, weightlifting session as I am for boxing or for jump rope because I feel like I need to use my mind for it. Um, so I guess, you know, in- Yeah, I'm whereas like, I almost combine weight training with, with meditation. I, it's sort of like I've listened to the same soundtrack, I've my, my gym soundtrack, you know, and it's like I've heard the song so many times and it's like the same movement, but like, it's almost like I kind of, I'm in a meditative state. So I think there's there's not one way to do it. You just do what works for you. 100%. I think when you when you talk to any expert in um in any any kind of strength training, weight training, uh, high performance, it really does come down to that advice. You have to do you have to learn to listen to your own body, you know? Right. And I think that's a, a really and enjoy key training. Point. Enjoy training. Enjoy training. Uh just keep doing it, you know, make it a habit and uh I always I I used to think of it as the brain. We were the, you know, the brain is the person. But I've, I've really started to revise that. We we have a central nervous system, and that that's the brain. But we have a peripheral nervous system, which means everything else. Like all the, there are neurons through your arms, your legs, you know, the gut. All of these right. inputs are going back to the the central place, the brain. But um, I think it's really important to keep in mind the body because um, we aren't a disembodied brain, you know, you are the brain with the body, right? And, and taking care of sleep is so important for our health. 
taking care of exercise is so important and nutrition. You know, those are, there's like a very obvious advice that we've known for generations, but um, all of that impacts the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. So um, we won't necessarily see it coming, but like there are those clear benefits. So um, I, I like your approach of just trying to do different, you know, trying out different elements right. to, and it, the, the same thing may not work for you versus me or versus someone else, course, but yeah, like yeah. finding the correct balance right. of things can be very helpful. And I think we're in a good position to try to do that these days. Of course. Yeah. And I think like, and I, again, I think it starts with awareness and education. So, um, I, you know, I'm showing you these kind of, these are the eight modules that we have for the brain optimization lab. So these are the ones that, you know, the, the research that I've, I've uh, previously ran um, the military programs for Concussion Legacy Foundation. Um, they are, you know, amazing organization, and they have this thing called Operation Brain Health, which you know serves to educate um, veterans and athletes on ways to increase their brain health. Right. So I think um, our, you know, we're taking a, a slightly different approach in terms of like telling stories and then getting um, kind of the research in layman's terms and expanding kind of our and then expanding the topics because um, they're attached to universities, so you know they can't kind of dive into the more um, uh, things that are emerging, right? And so there's a lot of research, which I totally understand. Um, again, I, uh, I'm not constrained to those to those boundaries. So we can just have a, where they're, where, like they have top experts in the world. And I think the difference um, that we're trying to do is, is to really provide these tools to, to veterans and then continue to lean on, you know, Dr. McKee and Dr. Nowinski on, because uh, there's, there's a lot of snake oil out there, right? On what it actually works for the brain and what doesn't, right? So, and we need- Right, placebo effects yeah, are real. Right. Like yeah, we yeah. sometimes just think ourselves And profit, into, right? People are just trying to sell better. sell a solution to one of the biggest problems in America, which is mental health. And it's like, you know, you have to you have to really be careful with what's out there and what you're listening to. It's hard to know. And some of the things that do help optimize the brain sound like science fiction, right? right. I mean, it's really kind of challenging to know. And we, we often scientifically haven't studied things well enough. Mm -hmm. But a lot, there's a lot of synergy here because we think of as um, like the, the pillars of brain health are sleep, nutrition, you know, social connections. Um, these are um, these are nutrition. Is these are some of the exercises. These are fitting with yeah the, with the, your the, pillars as well. Exactly. Yeah. So um, I'll just kind of so the listeners know what we're looking at right now, and we'll put it on uh, the YouTube video. But um, so our eight modules are fitness, mindfulness, um, psychiatry, nutrition, contrast therapy which is going from sauna to, you know, cold, um, hot to cold, emerging therapies, things like psychedelics, uh, still like ganglion blocks, uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Brain stimulation. Yeah, brain yeah. stimulation, exactly. Um, sleep and connection. So from these, you know, obviously you have your more, um, the more traditional ones, which I would, you know, would think would be fitness, mindfulness, psychiatry kind of nutrition, um, sleep and connection, um, you know, is there one that's the most important of the other? Is a holistic approach for brain health the 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 best approach, or like you know, are there things that some people should prioritize if they only have a certain amount of time? What's your kind of take on the traditional ones? Yeah, when I look at those eight, sleep and social connection come to the forefront. If you don't sleep, everything goes to hell reliably. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I've even heard that. I don't know where I heard this, but like the the most effective torture is to sleep deprive somebody. They will not be able to withstand. It would just break down mentally because like our brain needs to sleep. We have to clear a lot of toxins. We have to consolidate memories. It's just, you know, it's unavoidable. Um, con social connection as well. So like solitary confinement tells us that's horrible for one's health. You know, it's COVID's so, a great example of that. Yes, I mean, even in a very small, and COVID was not nearly as isolating as actually someone who's literally disconnected from other people. Um, but I think those two would be um, the ones just people essential. should prioritize. Yeah, if you don't have yeah. those, if you don't have, if you're not sleeping well and your, um, your social network of, of pe close people is, is not um, helping you, that, that's going to be really devastating. And it could even be just like a, a good friend, like one good friend can be enough, right? right? Um, so those are really meaningful. And then I would agree fitness is so important because again, the, the body's natural state is to have a rhythm where we get active, we explore. I mean, it's so helpful for our mental health. Mm -hmm. Like one of the best things I've done was uh, I took this 
12 day hike up in the New Mexico mountains with, um, with my two sons. And it was a, it was a, a scout troop. It's called Philmont, which is like the iconic hike of, um, of BSA. And it was amazing. It was like, you, you just would walk, you would just walk for miles and miles. It was like 96 miles. And right. it was the just sun on your face and around nature. With yeah. It was, you love. It, yeah. It, it was, it was inescapable that this was a key um, part of the human experience. Like we are kind of meant to meander, explore. And, uh, there was this amazing thing that happened. Like we were getting in amazing shape as well at altitude and right. like oh, yeah. going up hills and like, you know, everything was working. And, uh, we were a tight knit social group. We were like a tribe, you know, and it was, um, it was an amazing thing because it was so different than my office life. And I do have a really satisfying work life. You know, it's just that, sitting in front of a screen is just not our body's natural state. And I think that does become overlooked. I think it's getting, we're getting to appreciate it more as a society that yeah. you shouldn't, you should not be sitting in front of a screen. Um, you know, the, even the best of us at, at focus are gonna lose it eventually if we don't take breaks and get out and move. Um, there is something really satisfying about exercise and I can't really explain, it's not the same thing for everybody, but I mean, there's talk of endorphins, um, there's just, it feels, it feels like you're, you're reaching more of this a is, peak state, you yeah, know, if you, I, if you keep that up. And right. and I think mindfulness plays along with fitness. As I mentioned, like my, my weight, my, um, exercise routines all are set to music. Mm -hmm. And I think that actually allows me to go into sort of a different mental space where I'm sure I'm experiencing neuroplasticity, Yeah, right. you know, and I'm like, you just feel in tune as a organism, not just a central nervous system. flow state or kind brain. of, yeah, I feel like, yeah. Yeah, maybe the flow state. Mm -hmm. So the flow state is, uh, that's like the peak, I, you know, I don't think anyone ever knows, are they really in a flow state? But right. I, I think there is something like that. And when you, when you produce something for others, you get into that. So like, um, I, I really enjoy art and uh, you know, painting puts me in like a meditative mm. sort of flow state. So sometimes these acts of creation, where you're kind of drawing from your consciousness. My can flow be state's very boxing and, and jump rope. Like I feel like so, yeah, yeah again, like. Yeah, or like there's art therapy for right, a yeah, reason. Yeah, exactly, like, you just have to find, be, and I think yeah. like where, again, there is, and I'd say this every time I can, like there is for anyone dealing with depression and anxiety right now, like there's so much hope out there for you. Like there is something out there that, that will work for you. Like I absolutely 100% promise because I've been in the place where I thought that there wasn't and then I was never gonna escape it and I did, right? Through trying and working hard, right? Like there's nothing harder than escaping depression and anxiety. I think, you know, I think another quick point is through my depression, as I look at these kind of having this conversation and looking at these images right here, like when you are depressed and when you are anxious, it's just a, such a slippery slope, right? Like you know, you're too anxious to, you don't want to see people, right? Because you're, because you're too anxious or too afraid to talk to people or- And know, then the problem just gets worse. You're so sad, right? Yeah. And you're not sleeping, right? So then the problem just exacerbates and then you're not eating or when you do eat, you're trying to, um, you know, right, get that, get those, those um, hormones or that dopamine back or whatever it is, right? And you, then that leads into addictions. And so it's just like, there are pillars for brain health and if you are, like you said, if you are depressed or not where you want to be, you can get there. And, but you have to be willing to put in the work. And, you know, you kind of talked about at the gym, you feel like you are chasing this kind of like a better version of yourself, right? Um, and I think that's because you're putting in hard work. So it's like, you know, you're, you're doing something that is not necessarily comfortable, but you know that it's gonna be better for you. And because you're doing that, it's, you are satisfied. Yeah, and I think there's an important mix of like solitary activity. So I'm very solitary at, at the gym. I had a training partner really early that kind of got me going and then I, I've just done it myself. And I just, that's a, this just a, um, just kind of me within my own mind. But then I, I mentioned the hiking instance, of like that was really, that was social too. And I, and that, that I think is really key. So this is maybe a, a good point to get to in the conversation. I think having another person, the power of another person is mm -hmm. incredibly potent, um, not just to exchange ideas, but um, to make those connections. And um, you met Michael Lundy, who's, um, who works with me. Michael was one of my PhD students. And that's one of the great things about my, um, my role as a professor is I can basically sort of 
pay it forward. Like I, I was mentored by great people, Keith Holyoke, Nancy G and, and Mark Desposito at UC Berkeley. They all had a really big impact on my early career. And I try to do the same thing for younger scholars. And, and Michael is a great example of he's, I, I know you're going to talk Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He's a great martial artist, brilliant PhD. And he, he really got me thinking much more about the art of conversation, you know, how we can use conversation and talking to one another at, for therapeutic benefit as well. And we're, Michael and I are, are specifically applying this to our polarized politics, you know, so it's, it's just a broken record moment to say, well, we're polarized and it's toxic tribalism. Michael and I try to try to re, reclaim t- tribalism. We, we want, we're tribal beings, you know, like we're hunter gatherers at the core of it. And we need to be in a, in a group. And that's, that's kind of like our natural state. And so the, the obvious remedy to Michael and I is like, we got to have better conversations. We got to open up about these things. If we don't want to be polarized, let's talk about it. Mm-hmm. And lo and behold, if you do that and you approach people with that sort of open attitude, good faith attitude, that's when amazing things can happen. I mean, you mentioned like we had a really good conversation um, last week when we when we met. I think that's possible when when both parties are kind of up for it. You know, like yeah, let's talk. You know, we're different. Let's actually explore those differences. Yeah. And so I think you get a really important boost from um, just social engagement. That is so critical. Right. And I think you know. You are you familiar with Liver King, the guy in the in social media? No, no, he no got, I'm not. He got uh, uh, canceled pretty hard, but you know, Liver King kind of draws back to like the he. I mean, he's just like he was like super roided out and like looks like this like action like Hulk kind of guy, um, like you know, super high testosterone and like doesn't shower or like or like he sleeps on like hmm. rocks and just like so he said, and he also said that he was hundred percent natural. But you know, I think so. There was a a complete made up piece of this character, right, to sell his product. But there's also the tr- the truth in what he was preaching and which I respect from him doing that was it was like these like primal tenets, right? Um, you know, uh, doing difficult things, right? Social connection, a sense of, of purpose, right? Hunting and, um, you know, and being in nature, right? Like all these things that are, are like you said, our ancestors did like did do. It's kind of like where we came from. Yeah. Right. We don't, in our modern society, we don't make those things part of our lives. We should more, but um, right. yeah. Yeah. So it's like, you know, it's, it sucks that what is truth kind of got masked by other things that were a lie. Right. And then like so many times mm-hmm. in, in society, right. Like some things that might be good for people can be ruined by people who take advantage of it. So it, p- other people are complicated. That is the challenge. Yeah. 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 Um, but I think, I mean, as you were just saying that, and as I look at these kind of brain optimization labs and he has these like certain tenets, it's like a lot of the things do line up, right? Um, steroids is not one of them, but, um, you know, certainly, <laughs> um, but hormones is. And, um, you know, I talked, I know, I know one of the things you talked about and, you know, again, um, I think it's best that I save because I've, I've, I've taken a lot of your time already, um, but I think it's best I save the, um, the, I think a good transition is to talk about your work on values Right, um, yeah, yeah. because because I think the conversation that I'll d- dig that that I'll allow you to introduce, but um, the conversation I'll I'll dig deeper to with Mike is your new study and what you said. Right, having hard, difficult, polarizing conversations while not you know losing respect for someone or, or feeling you know hatred or or anger. Um, so you know why don't you first talk us through how you came across values um, and kind of the your passion in in that research. Yeah, values are, you know, if, if you say like, what are your top values? People say like, honesty, you know, and, and um, integrity, you know, like they're just words, right. right? But we kind of all know what they are. And um, I had this really interesting experience where this, another former student of mine, Adam Teed, who's a PhD, um, had come across this values work. Milton Rokich did this work historically, and then Shalom Schwartz. So Schwartz is an interesting scholar. He's um, he's American, but he spent a lot of his career in Israel. Very international scholar. He does a lot of surveys. And Schwartz's whole career, you know, and he's very senior at this point, was devoted to identifying values. Like, are there common values that all humans share around right. the world? It's an inspiring idea. And out of that research in over 90 countries at this point that he and his colleagues have, um, you know, queried about their, what do they value? Um, he's, he's developed 
10 basic human values okay. that can be found across all these cultures. Now we don't sh we don't all express the same degree of these values. You know, different cultures kind of have maybe a greater priority on some over others and we have individual differences too. Um, the values are things like benevolence and universalism. It's like outward focus, you know, care for others and um, you know, those close others as well as those distant others, power and achievement. Those are things that are about yourself, you know, getting getting your own work done or gaining influence. Um, some other core values are security, conformity, and tradition. Those hang together. And those are those are really core because if we don't have security, we don't have anything. You know, right, so like right. you gotta be into national security no matter who you are, right? Mm -hmm. If you're going to have any sort of sense of thriving in life. You got to focus on those. And then across from those are self-exploration, you know, like this sort of openness to change, seeking stimulation or excitement in life and seeking the good things in life. And those are the 10. And um, I just became really energized by this research because it's just fascinating to me that, I mean, it's inspiring that in 90, really 90 cultures, those 10 values show themselves, you know, it's sort of like, well, if, if that's true, we can bond with anybody, right? We just have to find a value that we share in common. I happen to be really, it also says a lot about our, our lives. So I'm really high on security. Mm -hmm. I've taken the survey many times. Yeah. I very I much value security. So what's the name of the survey again? Uh, it's just called the values survey or okay. the, the basic human values survey. And the, the name associated with it is Shalom Schwartz. Cool. Um, and I got to meet Schwartz at a uh, at a conference ju in 2020, just before the pandemic hit, mm. and it was such a highlight for me because it was like, wow, he's get, he's getting a you know sort of a, like a, a career achievement award, um, and I, I it was like I was like a Schwartz fan, I'm like wow, Shalom, yeah, this right, is awesome, right, you know. Yeah, right, so, yeah. And I just kept seeing him all over the meeting, and I was just like congratulating him on his career, even though I had never worked with him, and I I only had done a couple of studies that had to do with these values. But I've come to see them as, you know, we all know uh, the primary emotions like, you know, anger, fear, disgust, surprise, happiness. We know cognition, like we know narratives. I feel like values are like the glue that binds your emotions to your narratives. It's the things that we will actually fight for in life. And um, I just think it's so inspiring that you and I could discuss what we think about security or what we how we balance that with self-direction. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a great conversation to have because right. the, it is a balancing act. You don't want to be locked down like we were in COVID and you don't want to be just everyone running free chaos. Right, you right. have got to find a balance. Truth is in the and middle so, somewhere. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, that's great uh, terrain for conversations for a polarized nation. It's like, let's actually bond over not Republican values or Democrat values or liberal values or conservative values, but human values, you know, and there's 10 of them. You got 10 yeah, shots right, right, at this. Right, right, right. right. So yeah, I really it, am enthusiastic about this. No, I mean, and, and, and that makes so much sense, right? And it's like, like, that's why, you know, I think, I think a perfect example of that is like, you know, um, you have a, a best friend or a good friend or someone in your close circle group, right? And that person, um, has a completely different religious view from you or a completely different um, political view from you, right? But you still don't hate that person, right? You still love that person. Maybe it's someone in your family, right? So n even though you have polarizing opposite views, you know that you guys align on one of those values, right? And you guys yeah. can trust each other in areas of your life, right? And so that it's, but with the country, right? We have, we have radical lefts and we have radical rights, um, you know, liberal and conservative people who have their own agendas and are trying to get elected and make money and do this and do that. So, yeah. so then when you hear them giving their perspective in the news, then you believe that to be truth. And then now that's the truth in your own life. And you don't even, you don't even know why you believe that. It's like, we've taken the campaign trail rhetoric too seriously. It's like we, we've neglected the fact that someone has to win an election. You know, they're, that's a different that's a different kind of exercise. It's me against you, one of us has to win. Um, but then at the end of that, you've got to shake hands and actually govern the country and do good for the people. And I think we've lost that second piece. Yep. And um, I think one of the other things that's important is the way you approach other people. So if you have a conflict 
you sense a conflict brewing with somebody, that's a learning opportunity, mm -hmm. right? That's not a chance to get angry. That's the wrong approach. You should actually say, well, they must know something I don't. They must see something different. I was gonna say, I think that's a chance and to be I curious. I wanna know what that is. I think that's a chance to be right? curious. I wanna know what drives them. And that is infectious. I mean, that can be as exhilarating as actually having a war of words, which actually isn't exhilarating. No, it's exhausting. Um, it's exhausting. Yeah, I mean, it, it gets your primal impulses up to have a conflict, but um, a more productive way is actually to um, be excited about exploring together, right? It doesn't have to be boring. I think political moderates as being boring. What political moderation can be is you value something, I value something a little bit differently, but we have something in common. Let's actually explore that space together. Right. And it's like two members of opposite tribes, like meeting on a hillside and doing some task, task together, like in gaining strength from their separate perspectives mm -hmm. and learning from one another. And I think that's an important part of our lives as well, that learning state. Yeah, most definitely. So. You know, I think, and for me, I think that was, it was cool to hear kind of you define human values because I think coming from a business background, I think of values as like, like an organization's core values. Um, so I'll read off our, or as you know, it makes sense from a, from as everything you talked about today, there's a difference between, you know, like a, the heartbeat of an organization, obviously versus the heartbeat of a, of a human being, right? And a lot of the times they can be intertwined, but, um, you know, so I'll, I'll just read off our core values at, yeah, at Mission yeah. 38 because I think the last value, which I'll talk about, is um, very important for this kind of puts a bow on everything that we've talked about today and the purpose of this podcast, right? So when I was creating the values for Mission 38, I, I wanted to have values that embodied who my brother was, right? He's, he's a decorated Marine, uh, heavyweight champion boxer, um, you know, record-breaking linebacker, all-state wrestler, right, um, was pretty much perfect until he wasn't. And then because- it's Like a what, human action figure. Yeah, literally, I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. So that that, that was Matt. Um, you know, I think at the core of our family and at the core of myself as a leader is steadfast love. Um, that's how the love that Jesus describes himself as, right, to giving to other people, right? So I think that everything as a leader and every conversation that we have and every polarizing conversation that we have has to be from this kind of perspective of love, right? Like no matter what you say or no matter, you know, what you, what you do or no matter what your opinion or your belief or what you've done or what you're going to do, like, I still love you, you know, like, and I, and that'll be the, that'll be the, the value or that'll be the emotion that I show you, right? No matter what, um, intense passion, right? Like you can, I think what separates, um, us from, uh, from other organizations, like you can hear the conviction and the passion in our voices because we've all dealt with it in one way or another. And then mental health is a, something that everyone can be passionate about. Um, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. because if, like you said earlier, you're either dealing with it or you, you've either dealt with it or you will deal with it. Um, the next one is um, comfort being uncomfortable, right? So comfortable being uncomfortable. There's nothing more uncomfortable than dealing with anxiety, depression, suicide ideation, OCD, you know, ADHD, right? Like, like you think it's uncomfortable going to the gym and, you know, putting yourself through a little bit of sweat and pain, like wait till the battle comes internal, right? Squats and deadlifts are uncomfortable, but they make you a hell of a lot stronger. Right. Yeah. <laughs> where is it? Where is exactly the mental battles? What you're saying here. Yeah. Exactly. And the anxiety and depression tears you down. So it's like, but, and what just makes it that much more important to implement these tools we've talked about today. And then, um, consistent perseverance, right? I think as you've so as you've explained so well today, there's so much hope and there's so many different things and you just need to keep trying, like just keep trying, keep getting up every day. Don't make irrational, stupid decisions. Um, it's the, actually, I've been there. So they're not irrational and they're not stupid. Don't make, don't make a permanent decision to a temporary problem because whether it's tomorrow or, you know, a couple of weeks or a month or a year, 10 years, like you will get through it so long as you persevere, right? And keep taking steps. Yeah, stupid decisions are learning opportunities. That's yeah, right. That's the silver lining of every mistake. Yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then the last one, so those four, Matt embodied to his core. And our last value is relentless vulnerability, right? That's the one that Matt didn't embody and that I used to not embody, right? And that most men in society and, you know, I mean, mostly, mostly men, um, some women don't embody being vulnerable. Um, and I don't say that in a sexist way. It's just the facts. Um, yeah, it's a wartime mindset. That right. You yeah. don't want to show any sort of um, right. chink in the armor. Right? And then Mike, when we were here last time, he said, you know, one of the things I appreciate about you is how vulnerable you are. 
right? And that for me has taken a lot of time and practice. And like once you do something uncomfortable, it becomes less and less uncomfortable the more times you do it. Um, mm, that is absolutely true. And I think you're right. That actually is a part, we, we talked about charisma earlier. Like that's the word for why someone has kind of a magnetic personality. I think vulnerability is a big part of it. If we're willing to sort of show a side of ourselves that's not that's not perfect, right? That that's actually a real bonding opportunity. And we think, respond to it. And exactly. And then going to your you know, your point on values and how do we have these conversations, right? Like if I can be vulnerable with you and if I can be vulnerable with someone, then they are much more willing to have to be open minded to what I have to say. Right. Rather if if I'm closed off and I'm arrogance, right? Um, and I, you know, try to act like grandiose and that I have everything figured out and that I don't have any problems. Like, why would I listen to that person? You know, I never would. And yeah, I, yeah. I know from my, in my own life, like those type of people to me are the, that's the quickest way to turn, to turn me off from the conversation is like, like, I don't trust you because no one is the way that you are presenting yourself. You know, there's only one person in history and that was Jesus. And, um, so I think vulnerability is, is a, is a, one of the things that might be interesting for you to explore as you kind of look at these polarizing conversations. Yeah, we have to admit when we don't know. I mean, you asked early in the conversation, like, how much do we know about the brain? I have no idea. <laughs> well, and that's, and I that's, can't even answer yeah, that right, question. Right, yeah, and yeah, right. I mean, that's the mark of um, a scholar that I would respect is like admitting you don't have all the answers. And when I right? asked you about psychedelics, you're like, you know, I, I don't really know, you know? Yeah, um, no, yeah. I, we, sh we should be in some ways... Um, skeptical of authority, not necessarily distrustful of it, but um, we we should question it. Like we need to get straight on kind of like w knowing what you don't know is so important to to life. It's like under getting insight um, about your own limitations. I mean, that is the plan to, to work on it, right? I, I like a lot of the values that you described, you know, kind of that value of persistence and taking a mindset of I'm okay being uncomfortable, it's a learning opportunity, it's gonna make me stronger, all of that stuff is so helpful to the brain. Right, yeah, absolutely. Um, man, yeah, I could talk for hours, but um, <laughs> I know you have you know, wife and, and, and kids to get back to. Um, man, why don't, we, why don't we close with some hope, right? Which is what I think this country needs. Um, and you know, I just listening to you and Mike talk, I'm excited to again dive into the work which you you know kind of spoke about your guys' project right now. Um, so I look forward to that conversation with Mike, and um, it was uh, amazing to to hear just your um, your expertise on on all of this. So you know, to end, first off, um, I'll ask you a question which we kind of spoke about before, but we're building a scientific um, advisory board for Mission Thirty Eight, right? Everything that everything that we talk about, I want to be backed by science, right? Um, and not in, not just science, but brilliant minds with good hearts who actually want to make a difference. So I would ask you if you would be interested in joining that, that board. I'd be honored. Absolutely. Thank you. And, you know, as we kind of lead, yeah, and just getting your, um, so that people know that like a 23 year old kid isn't, isn't the one kind of coming up with this research for the brain optimization lab. Like we are speaking to the most brilliant people in the world, um, for this. Um, so I think that's, that's hopefully, um, good for people to, to know, but no, at 23, you're doing a lot of the right things. I like the path you're on with a lot of this because it yeah. takes, you know, I, I was really surprised to hear that was your age. Cause, uh, I mean, it, it takes people a lot longer to conquer anxiety or, or come up with, some of the coping skills that you're you're onto here. So I think it's a really exciting project. I mean, again, it's, I think, you know, I think um, maturity and, you know, um, knowledge, right, and, and all these things in life, like like I've, I've been through a lot, right, I've, um, and I don't say that to brag at all, I wish I hadn't, yeah, you know, yeah. but like I've, I know what it's like to have a family with, the, with addiction, right, I know um, what it's like to have a sister with special needs, I know what it's like to have a, um, um, you know, a, a, a father with borderline personality, right? And understanding that that's not his fault, right? And that it came from his past. So I've had to kind of realize all these things and with knowledge comes a lot of power if you're willing to put in the work. Um, and so that's where the Brain Optimization Lab comes in. So, you know, if you could leave the, the, the listeners with one message of hope, what would that message be to them? To someone right now who's in a place, who's struggling, right? Who's, um, who, who needs to know that they're going to be all right, because if they don't know that, then they might do something permanent. What would be 
you know, your message to them and, and, uh, advice to give them in that moment right now? Well, I, I think it would be summarized maybe by saying you're not a finished product, right? You're in, you're a work in progress as we all are, right? And what feels, Forever. what yeah. feels crushing today, it will look different next week, next month, next year, you know, and, uh, also whatever you're experiencing, someone else has been through it and they've come out the other side and you can do the same thing. Um, and I think mostly it's just what we talked about moments ago, sort of like reaching out to that person, uh, lending an ear, uh, having a good faith attitude. You don't know their story, right? And, and I think we judge people negatively, uh, especially like in social media culture, like there's a lot of negative judgment that comes up and, uh, you don't know their story. You haven't walked in their shoes. You don't know the burdens they're facing. And so I, I, I try to do that in my own life is just to ask more questions, try to get the context. Um, and then you have a chance to relate to the person and look for those ment <laughs> mentors. <laughs> so so um, I think mentors are so critical and you can you find them in the least likely places and a great mentor can just change your life. Right, 100%. Well, I think Benny wants us to wrap this conversation. I think he's so. telling us we've yeah. talked enough. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Right. Well, thank you so much, man. And again, for the listeners um, out there, like I think it's it's good to know the science behind it and why you're going to be okay. But then, you know, take it from me that, um, you know, things, things do get better. Thanks so much for having me. It's yeah. been a pleasure. I'm happy to talk again, and I look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you so much, Doc. I, I appreciate you, and uh, looking forward to what the future holds. Me too. Awesome.